I don't think I don't think your friends want to watch us having a staring contest. What do you think? Don't don't look at them. Look at me. I think you just lost, sir. That's right. Well, hello there, endurance nerds. You're joining me for yet another video as 2025 continues to deliver on its unique brand of fuckery. And as much as I would love to go full Karen and talk to the manager, I'll just be like every other adult and soldier on. But hey, if you feel so inclined to hit all those groovy buttons down there, it might help me to feel all warm and fuzzy on my inside feelings. What feelings? Anyway. For those of you who have watched really any of my videos in the past, you will have heard me say on multiple occasions that there is absolutely no one size fits all for training. Social media influencers, some coaches, and even some athletes are all too eager to tell you that polarize is the best way to train. No, it's pyramidal. Wait, if you're not following the Norwegian method, you're a fool. Test lactate, don't test it, blah, 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 blah. The truth is that all of those methods are the best for the right person. And when I said that training methodologies and philosophies are highly individual, that wasn't some wishy-washy cop-out to make people feel better about their lackluster results. You need a No, no, I do not. There are plenty of people who put in the work, follow those training plans to a T, optimize nutrition and recovery just to plateau or even move backward. And people will see those athletes following the flavor of the week training methodology and assume it's the athlete's fault. The athlete in their own right will buy into this narrative too, punishing themselves because it works for X person so they must be doing it wrong. And in a world of cherry pick studies, selection bias, and monetary incentives, it's really easy to fall into this trap. But you need to look no further than the professionals and elite athletes who openly share their training data with the world to realize that something is amiss when anyone claims that X training method is the best for all athletes. You'll find people on the razor's edge of their fields using different periodization, training different relative volumes, some seeing breakthroughs even after years of being the top 1% by bucking the norm. And the very obvious reason for this is that for every training paradigm, there are going to be responders and non-responders. And the same person can shift from one to the other seemingly for no reason at all. It has more to do with the individual and their genetics, physiology, mental triggers, and so on than it ever did with the nuts and bolts of a training plan. Now, don't get me wrong, there are still going to be good and bad workouts and training plans because they should all be following the general tenets of performance improvements like periodization, progressive overload, specificity, and so forth. But how these are packed and stacked should be rightfully tailored to the individual athlete, their strengths, weaknesses, and goals. And I think for most of you, this feels intuitively simple on its face, but it also feels like opening up a black box to decode when you want to maximize your own genetic potential. It's certainly much simpler to see someone else's results and try to copy and paste their routine into your life, but to do so is at your own peril. There's good news though. Narrowing your scope to the right training modalities doesn't need to take years of experimentation and setbacks to finally stumble on the right answers. Simply understanding a little bit of physiology and some focus on your output and results can save you months, if not years, of chasing someone else's opinions on how you should be training. While we're not quite there yet, I think with the right inputs, AI will eventually be able to evaluate an athlete's trends and performance and spit out the training that will optimize results for the individual. I actually think some programs, especially in the cycling realm, have already done a pretty damn good job, but they still require that human touch and understanding to account for the biometrics and those other really critical intangibles that aren't yet incorporated into their models. This is where having a good coach can be helpful. But therein lies the additional problem that not all coaches are created equal, and many are all too willing to spit out variations of their preferred training approach to every athlete. The good coaches are going to live in the individual details and as such fetch a pretty decent premium. And let's face it, that's not in the budget for most people. The good news is that while it could be helpful, having a coach is not required if you spend a little bit of time understanding the stuff and attending to your training data more than just a collect and forget approach. In fact, even if you do have a coach, I firmly believe you can get the best results by understanding understanding these subjects and working in a partnership rather than as an automaton in your own training. And today I want to help you to understand the mechanisms at play that make it seemingly difficult to navigate through the noise and find the training plans that will actually drive improvements at the individual level. The answer is not particularly sexy or novel, but it's all too often overlooked and it comes down to what part of your fitness you're actually developing. Endurance fitness isn't just one thing, it's two central fitness and peripheral fitness. And if you're skewed too far in one direction, your performance might be hitting a wall. So I wanna break it down in this video to arm you with the information you need to ensure that you are choosing the right training plan for you. So what the heck are central and peripheral fitness? Why do both matter? And how can you train smarter to avoid plateaus and perform stronger? We'll start with central fitness. What is it? Think of this as everything related to your heart, your lungs, and oxygen transport. It's the engine that powers your endurance. So some examples of central fitness are VO2 max, how much oxygen your body can use in a minute, the higher the better, stroke volume, how much blood your heart pumps per beat, 
More is better and cardiac output. The total amount of blood flow from your heart, bigger engines push more fuel, making you faster. Think of central fitness like a highway system. Your heart is the central hub, your blood is the delivery trucks, and then the oxygen is the cargo being transported to your muscles. The better your highway or cardiovascular system, the more oxygen gets delivered efficiently, unless you live in Florida. In that case, I can't really help you. The king of central fitness is your stroke volume. This is how much blood your heart pumps per beat. Bigger stroke volume equals more oxygen delivered with every heartbeat, which equals more efficiency, meaning you don't suffer as much. So when you make central adaptations, you're improving your performance through increasing that stroke volume so your heart gets better at pushing more blood per beat instead of just beating faster, lower resting and submaximal heart rate so your heart doesn't have to work as hard to deliver the same amount of oxygen, and more red blood cells and plasma volume, so better blood flow and better oxygen transport for better endurance. And it's actually not that difficult to see whether or not you're improving your central fitness in your training as you can look for some key elements like your overall perceived endurance is improving so longer efforts feel easier to you, your measured VO2 max is improving, you can usually get a good gut check for this if you have a wearable or an activity tracker that uses your heart rate strap to generate a VO2 max reading. While you might want to take the absolute value with a grain of salt, you can generally trust those trends to see if you are improving over time. And you can recover more quickly between efforts, so your heart rate and your breathing start to normalize faster after hard efforts, and that next interval doesn't feel like it's coming quite as quickly. These are the things that often get lost in the sauce of training, as people myopically focus on metrics like FTP, CTL, threshold pace, and so on. But they are oh so critical if you want to improve as an athlete. So the question you should be asking asking is how do you train your central fitness? This can be a video unto itself, but the TLDR is that you'll need to train high intensity intervals. These workouts are going to teach your cardiovascular system to pump oxygen more efficiently and respond faster to demands. Repeated bouts of high intensity effort increase stroke volume, strength of the heart muscle, allowing the heart to circulate oxygenated blood more rapidly. And these efforts also improve the elasticity of arteries and veins, making it easier for blood to flow and deliver nutrients to the working muscles. Next is VO2 max work. Yes, this can also be filed under the category of high intensity but more specifically, training at or near your max aerobic capacity pushes your body to its maximum oxygen consumption limit, forcing adaptations in both oxygen processing and delivery. These efforts expand your lung capacity, enhance blood cell production, and increase mitochondrial efficiency, all of which can help muscles use oxygen more effectively. Additionally, VO2 max work improves the body's ability to extract oxygen from the bloodstream and boost cardiac output, making your engine bigger and more powerful over time. And finally, those long zone two endurance sessions. If you can fit these in, even one day per week, they can be a complete game changer. Over time, these sessions lead to cardiac remodeling, where the left ventricle expands and becomes more efficient at filling and injecting blood. And they also increase blood plasma volume, making it easier for the heart to fill with blood between beats. And all this sounds really great, but this is where people screw up. Central fitness has a genetic limit. At a certain point, you can only push so much oxygen to your muscles. You might be training harder, but your endurance isn't improving because your muscles can't use the oxygen any more efficiently. While most of you watching this likely have a good amount of headroom before you reach your genetic limit, the old adage, what got you here won't get you there, is very apropos when it comes to training that oversaturates central fitness adaptations. That's where peripheral fitness comes in. If central fitness is about getting oxygen to your muscles, peripheral fitness is about what happens once it gets there. Now it's not about how much oxygen oxygen your heart delivers, it's about how well your muscles use it. If central fitness is the highway, peripheral fitness is the number of exits. More exits equals more places for the oxygen to go, and that means better endurance. So the key factors of peripheral fitness are capillary density, the amount of those tiny blood vessels delivering oxygen supply to the muscles, mitochondria or the tiny engines inside the cells that convert oxygen into energy, and muscle fiber efficiency, how well muscle fibers are trained to withstand sustained efforts across zones. When you make peripheral adaptations, you're going to generate more capillaries per muscle fiber so better oxygen delivery at the muscle level, increased mitochondrial density, so more energy producing powerhouses to use that oxygen, greater glycogen and fat storage in muscles, which means that you can hold and activate more fuel so you can last longer, and better muscle recruitment and fatigue resistance. As you better develop your type 1 muscle fibers, your body uses the right fibers at the right times, and your legs won't quit quite as fast. Just like central fitness adaptations, you're going to see discrete impacts to your training when you develop these systems. You could push harder for longer without burning out, your legs don't feel like bricks after long efforts, talk to that flight of stairs you need to climb after that long ride or run. I'm sure you've had some choice words. And you don't rely as much on anaerobic energy early on to perform aerobic level work. A common reason that people may see inflated FTP values in something like a ramp test that can screw up their training zones. And this is really more of a general phenomenon that drives massive inefficiencies when trying to execute for longer periods or for higher load sessions. And improving all of these sound great, right? But how do you train your peripheral fitness? First, 
threshold and sweet spot workouts. These efforts are all about training your muscles to become more fuel efficient. When you perform at or just below your threshold, your body adapts by increasing mitochondrial density, hello, better energy production, and improving lactate clearance so that you can push harder without that burning, leg-locking fatigue setting in way too soon. Next is strength training. Yes, lifting helps endurance. Strength work improves muscle efficiency and neuromuscular coordination so you generate more power with less effort. It also reinforces tendons and ligaments, reducing injury risk. And finally, steady state and endurance work. This builds capillary density and mitochondrial function, improving oxygen delivery and energy production for those sustained aerobic efforts. Now, you might be asking how high intensity or higher power work wouldn't support your peripheral fitness. You're working your muscles hard after all, and it comes down to a couple key things. First, oxygen supply and not local muscle efficiency is the limiting factor here. Since executing the high intensity efforts relies heavily on fast twitch muscle fibers, they use more energy anaerobically, meaning they don't depend as much on slow twitch mitochondrial development or capillary expansion. These fibers are built for explosive power and not sustained endurance. And remember, peripheral fitness is about oxygen utilization. Anaerobic or type two muscle development has a pretty hard cap and is largely genetic. These muscles will certainly be developed to ensure that you can put the hammer down when you need the speed, but working these muscles isn't enhanced the muscle's ability to use the oxygen and the benefits of high intensity on fitness specifically are primarily central. And second is that there's going to be less time spent in an oxidative state. So peripheral adaptations, more mitochondria, increased capillary density, etc., thrive under sustained aerobic workloads, not max effort bursts. Even though short, intense work does stimulate mitochondria, it doesn't provide the same volume of stress needed for long-term endurance adaptations. Unless you're a track sprinter, the majority of your time spent in your sport will be aerobic. You need to train the muscles to continue continue to use the oxygen over the long haul, not just blast out those 10 to 30 second efforts and then immediately recover. I want to make a critical clarification though. No training zone is all central or all peripheral building. There is some amount of crossover impact across all the training zones. The distinctions I draw here are to highlight the proportion of impact and where you can best spend your efforts to develop the two areas of your fitness. But coming back to peripheral, without good peripheral fitness, you'll always struggle in the long efforts because your muscles aren't using the oxygen your heart is delivering efficiently. Now, here's the mistake most athletes make. They train central fitness like crazy and neglect peripheral fitness. For instance, they do only high intensity work. They push for VO2 max improvements and conflate short bursts of high power with true strength. They get really good at moving oxygen, but their muscles suck at using it. This is why some people have a really high VO2 max, but still get dropped in endurance events. They have a big oxygen highway, but their muscles don't have enough capillaries or mitochondria to process it efficiently. This is the big engine, bad gas mileage problem. Imagine you have a Ferrari engine, think high VO2 max, but you're burning fuel like an old pickup truck or have low peripheral fitness. From a practical perspective, that doesn't bode well for most athletes. You're fast in short bursts, but inefficient in long efforts, a paradigm that applies to all too many of Zwift racing junkie. But on the flip side, if you only train peripheral fitness and ignore central fitness, you'll be really good at cruising, but lack that top end speed. While I think this is less common with so many people itching for competition and bragging rights, it is a trap that many fall into, especially those advancing in years. Even if you don't want to compete, Keeping that central fitness close to your maximum potential can make things a lot more fun when you want to face that climb or ride with your local group, and more importantly, generates those general health and longevity benefits that will play huge dividends when you're still active in your 80s and your contemporaries are struggling to get to the mailbox. But the best endurance athletes, they have both systems maxed out. Now here's where things get a little bit interesting. You may have noticed that there is a common denominator between central and peripheral fitness, steady state endurance or zone two training. When you train in zone two, you're double dipping. For central fitness, your heart learns to pump more blood per beat, and for peripheral fitness, your muscles build more capillaries and mitochondria. That's why higher volume athletes who spend a lot of time in zone two develop both systems naturally. They still need to round out their training by working the other energy systems, but they get a good jump start on both sides of the spectrum simply from their load distribution. But what if you're a lower volume athlete? We'll call it less than six hours per week to train. The good news is that you're not screwed. You just need to be a little bit more mindful about your intensity balance. You need to avoid the common pitfalls in training. So don't turn every workout into a kitchen sink workout. If you have two hours to work zone two on a Saturday, resist the urge to attack every KOM or FKT. Each workout should have a purpose, endurance, tempo, VO2 max, etc. You're not going to find much fluff in a low volume plan as you'll have a good amount of recovery built in on the days that you don't train. So make sure you are focusing on the quality and adherence to those workouts that you do have, understanding that you might spend a higher proportion of your training time suffering at those higher percentages of your threshold to offset the overall lack of volume. The harsh reality is that given equitable quality and genetic 
genetics, a higher volume athlete will almost always have an advantage after a certain performance level. You'll see elite amateur racing categories break along those lines with your podium contenders, often being those who have put in a substantial number of hours and miles, but you can go a very long way with the time that you do have. If you understand central and peripheral fitness and learn how to train both properly, you'll get stronger, faster, and avoid burnout, maximizing on the potential within whatever constraints that you do have. So are you training the wrong one? Let's do a quick test to see which one you're neglecting here. Do you gas out on long efforts? If so, you lack peripheral fitness. Train longer endurance work and spend time around your threshold. Do you struggle with high intensity efforts? You lack central fitness. Add VO2 max or high intensity training to improve your recoverability and repeatability. Do you always bonk at the end of races? You probably need both. And fix your fueling while you're at it. There's obviously a bit more to it than that, but not that much. The bottom line is that if you only focus on one system, you will plateau, limited to the same courses or the same races, and being pigeonholed as a specific level of athlete. If nothing else, the secret sauce of any good endurance athlete is the flexibility to meet the ever-changing demands. So to recap, how do we become the ideal endurance athlete? You need to train your heart or your central fitness with high intensity workouts for a better VO2 max and cardiac output and long endurance sessions for that bigger stroke volume and better oxygen transport. Then you need to train your muscles or your peripheral fitness through long steady miles, increasing that capillary density and mitochondria, tempo and threshold work to train muscles to process lactate faster and strength training for more efficient neuromuscular function. And most importantly, balance your training. But like many things in life, Balance does not necessarily mean 50-50. So should you focus on one more than the other? In case I haven't made it abundantly clear, I will repeat this one more time, you need to train both. But seasonality is important here. So as you move through the course of the year, how you balance intensity and training will shift and maybe favor one or the other out of necessity or specificity. But more generally speaking, focusing on one more than the other will probably be driven in large part by your phenotype or your natural inclination towards certain outputs. If you're naturally more central dominant, you might be strong aerobically but lack muscular endurance. You might gas out when the duration cranks up, or your fatigue resistance sucks because you can't manage the lactate. You need more peripheral work, so you'll want to be more diligent with your steady state and strength training. If you're naturally more peripheral dominant, you have strong legs, but they burn out quickly. Maybe your heart rate stays too high too long, and you feel like you need a dirt nap every time you go out for that long ride or run with your local club. You need more aerobic base training and intensity to improve your recoverability. I think most of you can probably get a pretty good appraisal without a ton of effort as to where you stand. The answer to your performance problems is likely in the work that you've been avoiding. And a few tweaks to your plan to shift some sessions to a more peripheral or a central focus can go a really long way. Now, for those of you watching that are a bit more seasoned and are already well-rounded athletes, should you look for that 50-50 split? And the short answer is probably not. An experienced athlete may find it best to focus more of their time on peripheral fitness. As I kind of mentioned before, there is a ceiling for central fitness for every athlete. And if you've been training for a long time and you've been diligent along the way, you're probably getting pretty close to your genetic potential. You may face diminishing returns continuing to hammer that central fitness. So in those cases, keep those touch points at high intensity and leverage that critical zone two work to maintain your central fitness, but focus your progressive overload on those workouts that develop your peripheral fitness, training your muscles to go harder and longer. That's what she said. While relying on the that already strong aerobic base to support them. Just make sure that you are balancing your recovery appropriately. Not all load is created equal, and some shifting focus may actually require some trade-offs in your plan. You might even find that your total hours go down, for example, but your TSS might go up, requiring more recovery. If you're only looking at the hours, you may scramble to add more to your plan and set yourself backward. Training is multivariate with a lot of moving parts, and if you take nothing else away from this video, it's that nothing in endurance sports should be viewed in a vacuum. The idea of balance is not just some platitude, it's critical. So the brass tacks to sum up what we talked about today. When you hear central fitness, think your heart and lungs and oxygen transport. When you hear peripheral fitness, think your muscles and capillaries or oxygen usage. When you hear zone two, think strong crossover. If you train both properly, you will recover faster, perform longer and stop getting dropped. Except for by that one freak who drops everyone. Forget that guy. Now go train smart. And if you like nerdy endurance stuff with a healthy dose of sarcasm thrown in by this guy, hit all those buttons below and I'll catch you guys in the next one. See ya.